All right, everyone, this is Ross Ratty, and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast-style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits and vegetables and um, how to use all that stuff in the kitchen and really the weird and interesting things as well, and, and not just using it in the kitchen, but also how to grow it. And in today's episode, we have a really interesting topic. We're actually live, so welcome everybody to the live stream. Thank you for joining me. Um, today we're going to be talking about fig economics and tulip mania. Kind of a, a lot of tips we're going to talk about on how to buy a fig tree, um, where to get these things, you know, the, the different places that they're offered at, um, really the whole economics behind it because I do know a fair bit about business. I am an accountant by trade, so we're going to talk about the economics of this whole thing. Uh, we're going to talk about why prices are so high um, and then we're going to talk about just my overall recommendations on acquiring a new fig and uh, we actually have a nice little list list of things to talk about today so we're not we're not winging it this time but we normally we normally just uh, kind of go with the fly and um, you know I, I usually have a couple things in my head labeled out and say all right I want to talk about this this and this and um, tonight it's actually written down so um, I think there's a lot I want to cover and I just want to make sure that I want to cover it all and I want to say it all as accurate as I can because this is I think a pretty sensitive topic but uh, yeah thank thank everybody uh, for joining me hello everyone that's that's welcome or here in the chat say hello TJ hello Mike hello Denise hello hey Chris what's going on man um, all right, so let's get into this tulip mania, fig economics craziness that's been going on. Um, so the first thing I want to mention is that fig prices are at a, well, actually, before we get into this, whoa, one step back, is that this Friday, so today's Wednesday, it's the 8th of May, the 10th and 11th of May, so Friday and Saturday, there is the Landis Valley, Valley um, Urban Garden Fair that happens every year. And it's a local event that I went to last year. My buddy Big Bill, he's a good friend of mine. Grows a lot of figs, grows a lot of edible plants. He's got a nice little home nursery. He's the nicest guy, seriously. Chris in the chat can certainly attest. Um, and you can go here to his Facebook page, Off the Beaten Path Nursery, which I can put in the chat here for anyone willing to check this out. But the Urban Garden Fair is amazing. I love it. There's so many nice people there. I met this tomato grower last year that's growing hundreds of varieties of tomatoes and I made friends with him asked him a lot of questions and then of course Bill's gonna be there and he has a whole post here on his Facebook page labeling out and listing out all the rare varieties of figs he has for sale and all these other weird fruits personally I kinda wanna go but I'm, I think I'm gonna be busy this weekend um, but if you're in the area definitely check it out there's I wanna get some Yacone um, for sure, I want to see if I can get some Yacone this year. I did get some from a friend, but I don't know if it's going to come up. So, um, But yeah, anyway. Uh, oh, also lingonberries because I got one from him last year. But I think I want to get a few more of them because uh, I really want them to go a little nuts. But anyway, guys. Oh, hey, Iowa Fig. Chad, what's up, dude? All right, so uh, all right, let's start with the Fig Mania here. And... What is what is tulip mania, right? I guess we could start with that. Tulip mania. It's often compared to fig trees nowadays, how fig trees are going for outrageous prices, and people think it's a tulip mania in that it was a period back in the day in the Dutch Golden Age during which contract prices for some bulbs of the recently introduced and fashionable tulips reached extraordinarily high levels and then dramatically collapsed in um, 1637. So... Essentially, people believe this is the same thing, and but and honestly, it's it's really not even close because I believe the tulips back in those days were actually used as um, um, currency, as a form of currency. Um, you know, these are um, certainly high in price, and I you could maybe say that this is a bubble. I think this is a pretty decent image of what people think is that it goes up and up and up and then crashes. Um, I don't think fig trees are going to do that, and this isn't something that everybody is obsessed with. This is just uh, people that people are um, 
certainly using this as a comparison, I, I think it's a fa it's a so somewhat fair comparison, but I don't think it's very accurate. Of course, the prices are going up, but I mean, we could talk about history all we want, but inevitably, I think this is giving people a nice little uh, background on what is actually going on. If you're not really familiar with the prices that you're that you would be seeing, um, now why is this happening? Um, well, here's my personal opinion: is that there's no controls on this kind of thing. So when I go on to FigBid, and this is we're going to talk a little bit about FigBid and where to buy all this stuff in just a minute, but FigBid is really the main place that I like to use nowadays to buy and sell fig trees. This is where I sell them. Danny, my buddy Danny, has made this really easy. It's a great website. Um, I had no intentions of selling anything, and then I decided, you know what, Danny is my friend. I should see if I can sell something, kind of help out his website, kickstart the whole thing going. And then I did, and it turned out it was super, super easy. Um, it's way more fair than eBay for the seller. Um, and also there's no scammers. And that was a big issue with eBay was that you have a lot of people that were intentionally scamming people, were selling fakes, and there's a lot of unsuspected buyers that had just had no idea. And they would buy these fig trees from these um, these scammers, say that they were a black Madeira, say that they were you know, some other variety, Turns out it wasn't, and they are just selling any old fig to make a quick buck. And it really is a bit of a shame. And there's a lot of these people that are well documented and still to this day selling on eBay. So Danny took his, you know, his uh, his background of being in the law. He used to work for the NYPD, and he decided to just create Figbit. And I have to say, it's really well done, and I love it. I really do. I think it's the greatest thing. He certainly has enabled me to be able to sell things to you guys, and it's given me a lot of extra income. You know, it's not my main source of income, but boy, oh boy, has it made me a lot happier. So I've been um, very grateful to Danny. Also, what I was getting into is that there's just no controls for this kind of thing, and and this is why, really, the prices of figs are becoming so large is that these are not cherry trees or apple trees or plums that have been bred by a university that spent you know a decade or so breeding these particular fruits having thousands and thousands of seedlings to then select from and then patent those varieties to then make sure that their name is on it and that they are getting royalties every time those particular things are sold and there's also all these other laws that then protect other people from, um, you know, exploiting this whole thing. Whereas figs, it's totally the opposite. These are all varieties that no one owns. You can't patent these unless you were breeding them. You could prove it. There's only very few people in the entire world that I know of that are breeding these figs. Um, and those people will eventually be able to patent them and eventually be able to keep prices low for those particular varieties, but. Um, you know, that's a big, big reason why I think people forget is that these things are not patentable. These are varieties that have been passed down from generation to generation that have been growing for hundreds of years, even some of these in Europe have been brought over to the United States. And these things are just not something that somebody owns. So there's no real cap on this stuff. And I think that's um, a really important point to make that I think a lot of people just completely forget about and now I want to also talk about nurseries real quick before because we already we already got on to we're gonna get into the economics here in just a minute talk about supply and demand which Chad just mentioned in chat but um, we are gonna talk about that but I want to talk about nurseries because in all the years I've been growing figs which is about six or so years now somewhere around there I have learned a few simple truths and we're going to get into actually a couple of them as we go. One of them is that the classic figs that you can find in a lot of these nurseries by the way, whether it's Just Fruits and Exotics, these are some of the nurseries I recommend. Just Fruits and Exotics, Edible Landscaping, um, Rain Tree Nursery, these varieties that these nurseries are selling and have been selling here for years have not changed in price except for some of them that are on Just Fruits and Exotics, which we'll get to in a minute. But things like Hardy Chicago, Celeste, um, Violette de Bordeaux, these are incredible figs that 
yeah, they don't go for an insanely high price, but does that mean they're not tasty? Does that mean they're not um, something that does well in a whole variety of climates that's not going to put out a lot of really tasty fruit? No. In fact, I would say Villette de Bordeaux and Hardy Chicago are easily in the top 90 to 95% of all fig varieties that exist for any climate. Um, they're incredible, incredible varieties. There's a reason why people have selected these varieties over years, and that's why the nurseries sell these particular figs, is because they're actually really reliable and tasty figs that have been proven over years. And we forget about these things. I asked, I'm going to tell you an interesting story. There's a guy named Georgie, and he has a whole crap load of figs that he has introduced to the United States. He lives in, um, I, he used to, I don't know if he still does, but he lived in Jersey at the time when he was growing hundreds of varieties of figs. And he has a, a number of them that are, have his name, his initials attached to them that he found and then brought to the United States. And um, essentially, he's grown so many, so many varieties. And when I was first getting into figs, I actually met the guy. I met him in person at Bill's Figs in New Jersey over in Flemington, for those of you guys who have been there. And th at the time, this guy was a fig legend, right? You meet somebody in person, you've been growing figs for a long time. Let's say you're brand new and even you meet me, right? It happens. I don't understand it. I mean, I felt the same way, right? It's kind of like meeting a celebrity, even though I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying I'm a celebrity, but what I am saying is that that's what I felt like when I was meeting this guy. And I had asked him, of course, I wanted to pick this guy's brain. He's had thousands of, hundreds of varieties that he's tried in New Jersey. It's a similar climate to mine. What are you growing? What's your favorite? Yada, yada, yada. You know what he told me? Is that Violet de Bordeaux is his favorite fig. And I said, I, I thought he was sort of kidding. He didn't really say it in a kidding way, but I laughed. And I said, what? Huh? And I laughed about it. And I didn't think about it for a long time. And then after I got to taste Violet de Bordeaux and started growing it for a long time, I realized, oh my God, he wasn't kidding. He's right. It's an incredible fig. And um, for anyone to disagree with that statement would just really not have any experience. So that's what I'm kind of trying to say is that there's already all these varieties that already exist that are extremely cheap. I mean, look at this. You can get a, for at a quart pot $18 from Edible Landscaping. You could get cuttings of Violette de Bordeaux in the dormancy period, dormancy time, probably for even for free. If you ask, you can get them for at least $2 a cutting, you know. I mean, it's so inexpensive that people are overlooking the classics and overlooking what I would describe as the production trees. And I myself am going back and doing something I should have done years ago, and I'm creating these production trees. I've air-layered many trees. I've rooted many trees this winter time, all in an effort to get the varieties that I think are the classics that do really well in my climate. I have like four or five Violet de Bordeaux. I have like six to eight Hardy Chicago's. You think there's a reason for that? I think so. So that's just what I'm trying to tell you guys is that you know we don't really need to be going after this, and we're going. We're sort of a lot of the new guys are going after this, I think, in the wrong way. Um, so. Let's now get into the economics of this whole thing. So economics are extremely driven by supply and demand. Supply being the amount of things, the amount of trees that are in the market that are available to be sold. And then demand obviously being, you know, how much people want these things. Um, now, something like a really rare fig is going to have a really low supply because there's very few people even in existence that have it. So that's going to be one obvious factor there. Um, now, what kind of messes with me here, we sort of talked about demand and why some demand is just unfounded. Does just doesn't make any sense, right? The classics, we just went over that. But what kind of messes with me is that when people say that, oh, I don't like the fact that fig prices are so high, it just it just really doesn't make sense to me because what you really don't like is capitalism and you really don't like basic economics is really what that is because it's not like a lot of us although there is people out there and I could go here and look at the fig trees on Figbid 
and look for some of them that are buy it now as an example and you could scroll through this list and these are really cheap trees as an example but you know maybe you can get some that there's somebody out there that wants outrageous prices and they want you to buy it at exactly that price but for the most part people are doing this in an auction style and they're letting the buyer decide what these things are worth obviously you can see this right 22 bids $85 right so who's really at fault here and people put a lot of blame on the seller and they try to attack the seller and they try to say oh well this person's just trying to hype it up and trying to make money and trying to do this and trying to do that but when in reality it's just basic economics guys what is somebody willing to pay for something is what the price is set at that is what capitalism is and I had let me tell you guys a quick story about this to drive this point home is that I took up painting for a little bit I started doing some oil painting a couple years ago and I when I first got into it I got into a nice little art gallery and then I met some nice people there and then they had this class that they were offering because it was all done through a university. And um, I was sitting there in the class and they were teaching us about how to kind of prepare your artwork to be in a gallery, to be sold. Because it was interesting to me and I was learning all these different things, right? And I was in the class with all these old people. Um, people in their 60s at least. I mean, that's kind of what this whole thing was sort of about. I was like the youngest person in the room by far. Um, and there, were, most of these people have already been doing this. They've already been selling. They've already been put, having their artwork in a gallery. They've already been doing this. I was like the newest, and I was also like the youngest. So I got this nice little bird's eye view, sitting in the back of the room, seeing all these people in action. And one of the topics that came up was that they were talking about what you should sell your artwork for. And the, the person instructing the class was saying, well, you got to take into account materials. You got to take into account how much time you put in. You got to take into account what you think it's sort of worth, right? You got to take in all the, all the, the basic expenses, right? If you're going to sell anything, you got to think about what it took to actually put, put into that particular thing. Um, in the fig trees case, certainly it's going to, you're going to take into account the soil, the pot, driving to the post office you know the postage the amount of time and the water and the electricity that it took to create these things from sticks into figs so then i was sitting there in the back of this room and then they got into the topic of oh well also in addition to the materials it's also just well isn't it just what they're willing to pay right that was what somebody raised their hand and said in the class to the instructor and said isn't it just what they're willing to pay that's what it's worth and then they got this whole crazy big debate. All these mature people that are not children got in this really angry debate in an art class about how paintings should be sold more than photographs. And that painters should have higher, um, higher costs and they should be sold more and it's you know more this, more that. And it's like, really? At the end of the day, it should just be what you know, it should just be what these things are willing to be sold for, willing to be bought for, right? The seller, the um, the buyer sets the price, not the seller. And I think I just believe in that. And you can obviously disagree, but that's that's really basic economics at the end of the day. Um, you could put in all these supply and demand curves, have all this crazy stuff in there, but at the end of the day, really, what is it someone that's willing to pay? And if we are bidding on them that is what's happening so for someone to then complain about the prices just doesn't make a whole lot of sense but here and this is where I want to turn this around a little bit and this is what everybody has been thinking right when is Ross gonna come out with this when is he gonna say this well certainly the prices of these figs are being driven higher by people looking to make a quick buck and this is where a lot of the anger also comes from so people making a quick buck what does that exactly mean how, how can I define that well I know people for a fact that people have told me either to my face over the internet that have told me that they want to get into figs because they want to make some money and they actually want my assistance 
And I have told them, don't do it. It's not worth it. You can't, you're not actually going to make your money back. In fact, to me, which I never ended up going into this with that intention, but I would have liked in the beginning certainly to make some money back. I would have liked maybe not to make the entire thing back, but maybe a portion. I think everybody goes in that with this, at least that thought process, all right? We're not all in this for complete charity, right? Especially if we're going to spend $200, $300 a tree. But there's a lot of people out there that want to turn this into a business and want to legitimately make this into something so that they can make their money back and then some. And I'm here to tell you that that's just not going to happen. And I'll get into that in just a moment. But that is a big reason why that thought process there, that little thought that passes through everybody's head when they're bidding on a fig tree. Let's say I want to buy this one here. It's already $85. And let's say, you know what? I want to pay $200 for this one because it's gone for $200 in the past. And I know that this fig tree is going to sell for a lot in the future. So then I'm going to bid high on it, it's not going to be the biggest of deal because then some point down the road, I'm then going to resell this fig for a similar price or a price, a price pretty close to that. And in my opinion, that is really what's making this whole price thing perpetuated even further. Not just supply and demand, not just what the person's willing to pay. You know, not just the fact that there's no controls on this and none of this is patented, but the fact that everybody has that little thought process in their mind that, oh, well, it's $300, so maybe next year I can sell it for $150 and I can make a bunch of my money back. There is certain situations that where that can happen, and I'm not going to disagree with those people that, yeah, you could do it, but in the long run, take me for an example, I haven't come even close to making my money back. And this is the first year that I'm actually selling anything, right? This is the first winter that I took selling of cuttings seriously at all. This is the first spring and summer that I'm gonna be taking selling trees at all at seriously at all. But in six years of growing figs, I am in the hole, big time. So I just wanna make that point abundantly clear to you guys that in no way, or do you think that you're gonna make all your money back? And then some. And then there is these certain situations, and here's the only situation, the only situation, someone just mentioned Ponte Tresa and Trat. And Ponte Tresa, for those of you who don't know, sold for crazy amounts of money. I think it sold for like $1,000 a couple years ago. Some woman went absolutely berserk and bought it for $1,000. What can you get a Ponte Tresa for today? Maybe 50 bucks. In fact, they've gone for even less. I think last year, Fruit Nut was selling them for like $25. I think I picked one up for like $25. So the point is, is that if you don't have a variety that's not going to last, that isn't, the only variety in my mind that's ever really withstood time and sells for a lot of money year after year after year is Black Madeira. Why? Because it's undoubtedly and said amongst the entire community to be one of the tastiest figs and I don't think it's gonna forever be or do I think it is the tastiest fig right now I actually think Cold on Blanc is the tastiest fig by my own personal standards but without a doubt every single person in every single climate that's ever tasted a black Madeira is just saying wow and that's what you're paying for is that experience that wow that's why people buy wine that's why people buy these $50, $100 bottles of wine because they know that they're going to get this bottle of wine that's going to really blow them away. You're buying, you're buying that excitement. You're buying that experience. And certainly with a Black Madeira, you're going to get that. So there's the, that's, the, that's the only fig that I know of for the last six years since I've been doing this has sold for crazy amounts of money um, for six years. Additionally, I want to put this point out here. Not only am I in the hole, but I've also never bought a fig for more than $100. I've never spent more than $100 on any single variety, whether that was a cutting or a tree. In fact, for a cutting, I don't think I've ever spent more than $30 a cutting. Um, and check out the amount of varieties I have arguably one of the largest more unique collections in the United States so you can do this without 
breaking the bank or spending crazy amounts of money. Um, now, what else do I want to get to here? So here's the other issue with people in this four quick buck is that not only are these things not going to appreciate in value, they are going to definitely depreciate in value. This is like buying a car, but it's going to take you a long time to propagate this tree. So you buy the tree. Here's the scenario, right? Let's say we're in a scenario and we're trying to make our money back and then some. We buy a $300 tree. We get the $300 tree. We grow it out for an entire season. We bought it in May or something like that in the spring. And then at the end of the season, it's big. We take a lot of cuttings. We root the cuttings. We sell the cuttings. And maybe it's a half. Maybe it's a quarter of what it was worth when I originally bought it. And we make some money back. But let's assume that you can even do that. Because one, you need a high reputation. People need to know who you are. They're not going to buy fig trees from you if they have no idea who you are. You don't have any ratings. You don't have any online presence. Why do you think Harvey makes as much money as he does and sells as many cuttings as he does? Because he has an extremely high reputation in the fig community. He's been in figs for a decade selling cuttings. His cuttings are of the highest quality. So, you know, if you think you're going to be in this community for six months to a year and think you're going to have the reputation to be able to sell this for as high of a price as you thought, think again. Here's the other issue. You didn't fruit it. Let's say you've got the tree, you got it in the spring, but then at the end of the year it grew a whole lot, but it never fruited. You never confirmed to see if it's actually true to type. And all these people, believe it or not, including myself, I'm selling fig trees that I haven't tasted yet, that I haven't fruited myself. Of course I have a really high degree of certainty that I've that it is actually true to type. I would never sell something that wasn't I didn't think was exactly true to type, but at the end of the day, I don't know for sure. And anything could really happen, right? Anything could happen. Just because I got it from the guy who it originated from, let's say I bought it from, you know, Golden Rainbow as an example. Where's Golden Rainbow here? Here we go. This is the guy who sells Golden Rainbow. He was the original founder of this tree. Let's say I bought some cuttings from him. He sent me some cuttings. I rooted them. The leaf structure looks right. Everything looks right, but I never fruited it. And it's like, okay, well, it's got to be right. I mean, there's a pretty highest degree of certainty in my mind that it's right. The leaves look right. The way the variety's behaving looks right. I got it from the original guy, but at the end of the day, I never fruited it. And there's this chance, as small as the chance it is, this could not be true to type. The tree that I then have propagated and then I'm selling to people and it's just not right. It's not ethical. So there's a whole ethics involved with selling trees and selling plants. If you have a variety of tree and you're selling it and you've never fruited it, that is just ethically wrong. I'm sorry. And here's the other caveat is that if you are going to do it, which I've done it myself, I'm guilty of it. Okay. No one's perfect, but if you are going to do it, you better have a reputation and you better have some policy set forth to help these people. If something were to happen and that this was not the right variety, it turned out to be completely wrong. Think about how you would feel if you had a variety that someone bought from you or you bought this from somebody, you spent $200 on the tree, you grew it out for a year, maybe even two or three years, because sometimes these fig varieties take three years to fruit. I'm not kidding. I mean, a lot, the large majority of them will take even only six months, but you know, you can get some varieties that just take forever. And you won't know for years, and years have gone by, and you'll never know. And then finally, the thing finally fruits, you look at it and you say, oh, that's just, that's just not right. And how would you feel if you spent that much money, that much time? It's not enough as the seller, in my case, to then reimburse you. I have to not only reimburse you, but I have to make it right with you. I have to then go the extra length and make it up to you in terms of your time, the effort. You know, I have to give you, in, in addition to a reimbursement, something that's going to make you a happy customer. And that to me seems right. And there are people out there that I have a full experience with 
that have not even asked me if I wanted a reimbursement, that have not even attempted to give me a reimbursement, and there's certain people, which there's many of them, by the way, that don't even exist in figs anymore, that are no longer around, that you can't even get in contact with them, that bought these things, sold them, and left, and ran away. The scheme worked, and they got out. How many people, out of all the fig growers, let's go to rfigs.com. Now, if, I, if you've been on rfigs.com of recent times, you know there's a lot of new members on our figs. There's a lot of new people that have shown up out of nowhere. I have no idea who a lot of them are. There's so many newbies. I'm sure a lot of you guys are actually on there, and I just don't even really know who the hell you are. I see your YouTube name. I, don't, I see your our figs name. It's so hard to keep up with the new people, and they're all over our figs. How many of these people would I estimate, and how many people, the people that have been in a fig community for at least three years, there's some of you guys in the chat right now. How many of these new people that are into figs are going to be into figs three years from now? Not many. Not many stick around long enough um, to make this a long-lasting hobby. I have found throughout my six years of being on Figs for Fun, being on our figs, being on a number of different Facebook communities, there is a pretty significant number. I would say at least 30% of the fig community just completely disappears. Never hear from them again. They introduce themselves. They make some posts. They talk for a little bit. At least 30%. So how many of the sellers are then also doing the same thing? In that they're in this hobby, they make a quick buck, and then they get out. I mean, that's why I'm telling you guys, reputation is a lot. Also, having a picture along with your listing of the variety itself that is particularly fruited for you, that has been confirmed, is, is just amazing. That's everything. To have the picture, to have a good reputation, and to have a, a reputation of then reimbursing people for then making a mistake and reimbursing and fixing that mistake, that to me is the full requirements of buying a tree that is legitimately a lot of money. You know, because if I'm going to spend a whole lot of money on a fig tree, if I'm going to spend $100, $200, what's a lot of money to you guys? I mean, it's all relative, right? Whatever that number is, if I'm going to spend that amount of money, I better have some really good certainty that one, it's true to type. It's, it's uh, again, it's going to be reimbursed if for whatever reason it's not true to type and that that person has a really good reputation. So for me, there's a lot of flaws with what people are kind of thinking here in that they think that they can make this into something profitable overnight. And it's just not, there's just too many issues here, okay? And there's a lot of ethics with this between you know wrong and right of what it is you should and shouldn't do as a seller and what you should and shouldn't do as a buyer. So. Um, what other what are some other ethics? I think that's really the biggest one and, and Chris just mentioned another thing here Don't use your own don't use somebody else's photo, you know um, That's a really big ethical dilemma that a lot of people use a lot of times you have to get permission if you don't get permission from the particular person that you're using their photo from That again, is just ethically wrong um, Okay no, oh, here's another ethically wrong person thing. Is that this winter, this cutting season, and it's actually still happening to this day, is that there was people that were illegally importing cuttings from overseas, taking them overseas from sellers overseas. It's illegal to import cuttings. It's illegal to import plant material. They were importing those things, and then they were reselling them at way higher prices than they bought them from. Whether they were buying them from Thierry in France, Nikki in Italy, um, LaRusso in Italy, um, you name it. Oh, also Kirill Donov in Bulgaria. There is at least four or five different sellers that were doing this, taking those varieties from those people, getting the cuttings for pretty cheap prices. Again, you're willing to take the risk of illegally importing them. Um, 
you know, so there is that, I guess, that, I mean, at least you, you were willing to take the risk and, you know, I guess you should be compensated in some way for that. But at the end of the day, you're taking advantage of people. You're taking advantage of laws. These varieties haven't fruited for you. Yes, they're from the original person. But again, what if they end up not being true to type? You know? And then you're then also, not only are you doing this illegally, but you're then you're taking advantage of people by upping the prices astronomically. We're not talking about just, okay, I wanted to make my money back. We're talking about taking the price of maybe 20 euros um, for a set of cuttings and then taking that and then selling the tree, turning that into a tree, and then selling that for $150, which is happening today, right now. So you got to really know who it is you're buying from. And uh, I just can't, I can't stress that enough. So then now my other gripes here, my other, and I want to get into recommendations here. I got one more gripe and then we'll do recommendations and then you guys will have a nice little Q&A and I'll get back to everyone's comments that has, was put in the chat. Um, thank you everyone for bearing with me so far. So one other gripe that I have is that there's a lot of hype that goes around and a lot of the hype is revolving around myself. People that, um, also people that have been growing figs for a long time with a high reputation that have tasted a lot of figs, hype is naturally going to form around these people. I have a YouTube channel with access to many, many followers with people that grow a lot of different figs. And, what I, and if I say something's good, a lot of people take that to heart. I've seen it personally. I've seen it in real life. And my thought process on this is that I don't want to be limited. I don't want to be... It's unfortunate because a lot of what I has to I have to say has a lot of weight to it, and I don't want to hype things up in a way that's making them really expensive for people. But people are specifically listening to my videos, saying, listening to what I really like, and then getting those figs and then trying to make a buck off of those varieties. I mean, that's that's a fact. And here's the other issue, and why I don't like this whole thing is not only is it is it being hyped up. But I want to be able to recommend things to you guys. I want to be able to say this is good because that's what I love. That is a big reason why I make YouTube videos because I love, and Chris can attest to this. Chris was at my house this weekend, this past weekend. And I said, hey, Chris, let me give you this. Let me let, me let you taste this. Let me let you taste that. And I gave him all these little weird different vegetables and I gave him this snap pea as an example. He couldn't believe it. His eyes lit up. I gave him some mint. I gave him some lettuce. I gave him some this. I gave him some that. And to me, that's the best part of growing food is that it should be a, a unselfish hobby. And that's why I love to have these fig varieties or any variety of anything. Let's say Mar de Bois as an example. That is an incredible strawberry. Incredible. If you guys taste Mar de Bois and don't like it, and it's the real Mar de Bois, then, you know, I don't know what to say because I could literally give that Mar de Bois to every person <laughs> walking down the street and their eyes would lit up. And that is the coolest feeling. That is the coolest feeling. I personally really love Mario as an example. Let's, let's give Mario as, a, as an example. Mario in Connecticut invited me out to his place last October. I visited him in Connecticut. We got to visit him, got to see him. He's such a nice, generous person. He gives me, he let me taste a bottle of wine. I wasn't expecting this. I didn't even know he was into wine. I didn't even know he had. A, he has his own wine store. Then it turned out that he gets this white bottle of wine. He opens it up, cracks it open, puts it in the glass, swishes it around, dumps it, puts the thing back in there, pours another glass, gives me a, a nice bottle or a nice glass of white wine has me taste it I taste it and I'm like whoa this is serious this is a pretty damn good bottle this is a nice little bottle of wine here this is a nice little thing here and then he does the same thing with a red and I'm like wait I didn't even finish the white yet <laughs> he opens, the, opens up the bottle of red pours it in the glass and then he 
swirls it around, chucks it, and then puts the, another glass of red wine in there and lets me try it. I'm not kidding. This was the most incredible, one of the most incredible things I've ever tasted. And for him to give me this experience, to me, is one of the best things you can ever do for somebody. Is to give them a piece of fruit or a piece of food and let them have that wow factor. Let them just honestly rethink their life and think, oh my God, um, I've been living my whole life without this particular thing. You know, so for me, I want to be able to make these recommendations to people based off of spreading joy and, and inspiring people. And if people are then taking my recommendations and then running with it and hyping these things up even further, um, that's just really, it's a sad thing. I, I really am upset about it. And to be honest with you, it's a reality. And maybe I have to change my strategy a little bit with that, but I try to be as completely honest. If this video is uh, is not proof of that, literally, then I don't know what to say. So, um, okay, so that's my last little grief there. And yeah, Chris made the, the, the funniest face when he ate the snap pea that I gave him. I'm telling you, man, peas are not... A thing that everybody loves I hated them as a kid and now they're the greatest thing ever so um, certainly my favorite vegetable but anyway let's go on now to some recommendations here that I want to make for you guys bidding on things now Danny as an example the owner and runner the person who created fig bid has some tips on just bidding you can go here and hit tips it shows you all kinds of different tips here he also wrote some articles be a better bidder how to bid and why and win any internet auction personally bidding in my in my opinion and i'm not the most expert bidder but if you want to win an auction you got to get in there at the last minute the last second you want to put that max bid in there and you got to cross your fingers that your bid is the highest bid of anyone else that's also bidding any other prior bid up to that last five seconds ten seconds I don't really fully understand it. Um, you know, you can add these things to your watch list. You can set a timer. Um, you can get a little notification, and and it'll tell you, oh, this thing has only an hour left, or something like that. And then you can start paying attention to it. Obviously, not everyone has all that amount of time, but if you really wanted to be slick with this and get things for cheaper prices, that's how you're going to do it. And I would certainly read this article here. He, Danny just wrote this up. I'm going to link this one in chat. Um, so the other recommendations I want to make is purely based off research. We've talked a lot about research. I think a lot of you guys are pretty good at this. And we've harped on this enough that if you don't do your research on a particular variety that you're bidding on, I don't know what to say. I don't know what you're doing. What are you doing? You need to figure out if the variety does well for you in your climate. Location, location, location. Without a doubt, figs do completely different in different climates, different soils, different amounts of water. Um, it's astronomically different between here and California. And if I were to give you guys a recommendation and I were to say, I really like this fig, you gotta, and you live in California, you gotta ask yourself, is this fig gonna do well in California? And then do your research. You know, you can't just take everybody's word like it's gospel if they don't live in the same place that you do. So um, you need to do your research not only on the variety, on the, the seller, but variety is everything, man. If, if you don't put in the time to figure out what exactly what strain you want, what variety it is you want, I, I seriously think you're going to regret it and you're going to end up probably wasting some money. Um, now, what else do I want to mention? I mean, research, 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 research is, is just incredibly important. Mm, what other recommendations can I make to you guys? Maybe we should think about this as we go. I'm going to go back in the chat and uh, say hello to everybody. Hello everyone, if you said hello in chat, hello. Thank you guys for joining me on this live stream. 
Um, these are always pretty fun, by the way. I really like doing them. Um, TJ said figs are definitely like Tulip Mania. Um, the original Golden Riverside went for $130 for a one count. <laughs> That's pretty insane. The original Golden Riverside should not be going for $130. I think you can get that for like $5 a cutting. Also, timing. You know, when you're thinking about when to buy these things, there's also a whole timing thing. Um, you know, if you just be a little patient, you're probably going to get this thing for pretty cheap. Um, there are certain varieties, however, that I never bought Black Madeira because I knew that if I was going to ever buy Black Madeira, I was going to have to spend lots of money, at least over $100. So what I just did was I waited and waited and waited and realized, oh no, it's never actually going to get below $100 a tree. So what I did was, um, is some people helped me out, plain and simple, just enough time in the community making enough friends. I was given a free Black Madeira. My UC Davis Black Madeira was given to me for free as a tree. I was originally given cuttings of Black Madeira for very inexpensive at the time by my friend Tony Mountain Figs um, in my first year. And then I actually ended up buying a very large Black Madeira KK very large in a 50 gallon size pot for a very inexpensive price. So for me, I, um, you know, you don't really have to be spending tons and tons of money. If you're willing to be patient, you make enough friends and you become, I mean, Chris as an example, just came to my house. He walked away with four trees. So, you know, you, you gotta just make some friends. Um, I've said that for years, I've said that for years to you guys. The only way you're going to be really be able to do this and get the uh, many varieties without breaking the bank is by making friends, by making solid friends that you can rely on, that you can trade with year after year, and being someone that you can rely on. Um, okay. What else do we have here in chat? That's actually a really good recommendation, by the way. So again, if you guys didn't hear it in the beginning of this video, uh, the Landis Value Valley, I'm sorry, Urban Garden Fair is happening very soon. This Friday and this Saturday, the 11th and the or the 10th and the 11th of May. Um, I've been there last year. It's a really nice event. Big Bill, who's going to be selling lots of trees, is there. Um, lots of fruiting plants is there. He has really nice trees. There's a lot of interesting people there. Go and check out this event for sure. It's in Lancaster, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, okay. <laughs> ben said, Black Madeira, the Charizard of figs. <laughs> that's really funny to anyone that's in their 20s. Um, but yeah, it is. Certainly is, and it just makes a whole lot of sense, to be honest with you. Chad said supply and demand for the latest, um, the latest crazy fig. Yeah, it's just I want to make this other point here on supply and demand and and the latest and greatest fig. What is the latest and greatest fig? Well, it's usually one or two people tasting the fig and saying it's really good, accompanied by really tasty photos, and then. It gets a high reputation for being sold for a high price and then people buy it for a high price because they want to re then resell it for a high price. And then it becomes the latest and greatest fig. And um, at the end of the day, only two people in the entire world have tasted it or two people that speak English have tasted it. And you're basing this crazy valuation off those two people. When figs are very variable, we've mentioned this, taste is subjective. Um, Location, location, location. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I can personally attest, let's bring up some of the really tasty varieties uh, or the really expensive varieties that exist today. Golden Rainbow, as an example. This is one. I don't really think in any way, in, in any league, is Golden Rainbow going to beat Black Madeira in flavor. It's just never going to happen. How do I know this? 
Well, because I can look at the fig and I can tell. Well, golden rainbow is a honey fig. By nature, it's a honey fig. Yeah, it's big, it's large, it's precocious, it's early. Um, but in terms of flavor, there's only one black Madeira. There's only one Col de Dom Blanc. And for any fig to then surpass those two figs, two things, in my opinion, has to happen. One, it has to have the perfect texture. It has to be thick, jammy, gooey, melt in your mouth, just incredible in terms of texture. Or it has to have a flavor that honestly blows you away that's comparable to some wines. And any, any fig that has a berry flavor, by my standards and by most standards, I did a poll, by the way, on our figs. There was a poll that I did. I polled the community. I think it was like 60% of the community likes berry figs more than honey figs and more than sugar figs. So by most standards, without a doubt, Golden Rainbow is nowhere near going to compete with the Black Madeira. It's not in the same league. I'm not saying it's going to be a bad fig because, yeah, it could be something different, something interesting. In terms of honey figs, though, where does it rate? Where does it rank? Because for me, I have not tasted a honey fig that compares to even Villette de Bordeaux, which is the standard. It's the standard berry fig. If you have a fig that's better than Violette de Bordeaux, let's say Black Madeira, Col de Don Blanc, then you got an issue because now you're not only trying to beat Violette de Bordeaux, you're trying to beat figs that are even two levels, in my opinion, higher than a Violette de Bordeaux. So, you know, again, taste is all subjective and take that with whatever you want to take it with, but um, what are some other really expensive figs? Well, Anything Black Madeira related. There's so many Black Madeira synonyms, it's insane. Um, what are some of these Black Madeira synonyms? Well, if we go to my spreadsheet here, which is in the description of every little video that I do for you guys, there's a fig synonym tab here that lists out every single synonym that I think is pretty much either 100% accurate or very close to accurate, or they're a very similar style of fig. Certainly with the Atriano type figs here, in this list, these are not synonyms. These are not synonyms, but they're very similar style, very similar flavor profiles. Nor do I think a lot of these are synonyms. The only synonyms that probably really exist is probably the Hardy Chicago's, maybe the Violet de Bordeaux's. At the end of the day, we've talked a lot about this too, is that there's a difference between synonyms and there's a difference between figs that have minor adaptations, but at the end of the day, they're very genetically similar. And those minor adaptations through years of adapting to a certain climate can certainly change the fig, certainly change the appearance. Certainly with these black mission types, that's very apparent that, yeah, they may be genetically very similar, but there's a lot of different adaptations in here that make a lot of these figs quite different. And you may actually want to experiment with a lot of these. In fact, I have probably five or six different black mission types that I'm experimenting with. But in terms of black Madeira, there's a lot of them that are almost exactly exactly the same and it's really a difference between which one's healthier which one's not healthier people say that one of them's larger people say that one of them's two weeks earlier at the end of the day a black madeira is a black madeira at the end of the day you could make the argument and no one would be able to disprove you why couldn't they disprove you because without genetic testing you can't really say that something is exactly the same as something else or not. So you could theoretically say that, well, Black Madeira KK is the same thing as Figo Preto. And check out the prices of Figo Preto. Prices of Figo Preto is probably, you know, a, a half or even maybe a quarter of what Black Madeira KK is. But Black Madeira KK gets this insane reputation. When in doubt, they could be very much so the same exact fig. And if you were to put them side by side, Black Madeira UC Davis, Black Madeira KK, Craven's Craving, Black Tuscan, Figo Preto, Madeira Island Black, Violetta, you would have put all these figs right side by side. You would not taste much of a difference at all. And it, the difference you would taste would be in the difference of how long they ripened. 
on the tree. And also, if you were just giving a, a particular tree more water than the other. Growing conditions. So, does it make sense to me, in my mind, that all these black Madeiras are selling for crazy amounts of money when you could just get one of them and make copies of that one? Why not just get Figo Preto, which is probably the cheapest of them all, or even Black Madeira UC Davis, because apparently it's not healthy. Why don't you just get one of those and make many copies of it? In fact, my Black Madeira UC Davis outproduced any of the other Black Madeira style figs that I have by far, and it is the one that has the most fig mosaic virus. Go figure, guys. Um, what other interesting figs are out there, or very expensive figs that are out there? Um, I just sold, as an example, um, Exquisito. And I don't want to take anything away from Doug, because I love Doug. He's a good friend of mine, and his figs are incredible. I've tasted them in person. I got to taste his Thermalito. I never tasted his Exquisito. Um, and from what I can tell, Doug really loves it, and he has great production with it. It's one of the most productive figs that exists for him. He's putting out three crops every year. He raves about it. And I don't want to take anything away from Doug. But is Exquisito going to be the tastiest thing in existence? Probably not. Fiorone Uvo, Oro. These, these figs with stripes. First off, Fiorone Uvo, Oro. Sorry, excuse me, guys hasn't even fruited, it's only fruited for one person without the wasp. One person, and I don't know how many figs they even got. Was it one? Was it two? Let's be honest here, you know, a lot of these figs have issues. And just because it has stripes, is that really enough to justify you getting it? I guess if you're in this to then resell it for a high price, maybe not, maybe, you know? Martinique or Amada. Parachal Ramada. There's very few Ramadas that even exist that do well in my climate. Why do you think I've never even shown you guys a Ramada fig? They're all looks. Alright. I think I made my point here. Is that a lot of these expensive, expensive figs just should not have those prices. It just doesn't make sense. They haven't been proven. And, um... Very few people have even tasted them, and at the end of the day, it's just it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense, you know. But then again, it's not the people like you guys that are listening to me and then trying to get that particular variety. It's the people that are then buying these varieties because they know they're going to go for high prices, so they're buying it and then trying to make a profit or make their money back. So that's really what's perpetuating these higher prices. Um, Okay, so Chad just said he sells just to pay for all the supplies he buys every year. He mentioned Ponte Tresa, how much of a mess that was for sure. Um, any form of Black Madeira sells for big money, yeah. Um, I think that's Wendy, right? Isn't that your name, Wendy? KY, uh, North K uh, Kentucky native. Um, you said uh, that I've wondered about your return on investment in your trees. At least you can eat your hobby nonetheless. Yeah. <laughs> With nearly 4,000 audience, 4, audience members, you could farm the hell out of cuttings to make some cash back. Yeah, I could. But definitely I have not made my cash back by far. Um, let's see here. TJ said, my biggest pet peeve is selling uh, unfruited varieties, varieties that people have not fruited and confirmed to be true to type. Yeah, I'm with you. And I'm actually going, I did sell one of them, two of them, this past weekend um, that haven't fruited for me. But the prices are not there anyway, so why should I sell them? If they've never fruited for me, why should I even sell them? One, it's unethical, and two, I'm just getting a lower price anyway. So I'm going to wait for a lot of these trees to actually fruit, get to a larger size, and um, I think everyone will be happier, including myself. DKEN said, I think Benby was irresponsible for hyping up that fig before actually properly identifying it. Um, he says the entire thing is a scam. Well, I disagree. 
and I think he certainly hyped it up, but he knows it's good. And I believe it's good. I believe it's a tasty fig. I don't think it's going to be Black Madeira, but I know for certain that it's a tasty fig. And I believe Ben's word, and I believe what Ben has to say, because I know Ben is a good person, and I know that he's trying to put his honest thoughts out there. He's not trying to make a quick buck, because if he was, he would have been selling a lot of these Golden Riverside, these Ben B. Golden Riverside trees for a long time, and he didn't. And at one point, he even offered me one for free. Um, also, at one point, um, through just messages of him, him and I back and forth, um, I've just personally talked to him about it, and I know for a fact that he's not in this for money. This is not an elaborate scam. That's just not true. And there's a whole issue that people have had with Ben's name getting attached to the fig. Well, it's not Ben who put the name on the fig. It was the guy, Robert, who originally thought the fig variety was called called Golden Riverside. So Ben, being a responsible fig grower, kept that name and grew it as Golden Riverside. He didn't rename it as something else. He didn't try to invent something new and take advantage of people. He, he could have just completely said, all right, well, no one knows who this guy is. I, just, I could have just said, I found this fig. I'm introducing it to the community, it's really tasty, and now I want to make a whole bunch of money off of it. But he didn't. He kept the original name. And then because there was already a Golden Riverside that existed, he then, um, there was some definite confusion there. We didn't want to mix up, and we knew it wasn't the same Golden Riverside of the one that already exists. I mean, that's obvious, right? The one from UC Davis is not the original, or is not the Golden Riverside, that rainbow that is now called Golden Rainbow. Um, so the confusion there then created the situation where we have to give this other fig a different name. We have to call it something else. Well, let's call it Ben's Golden Riverside because Ben's the one who introduced it to the community. So Ben's name should be attached to it. It makes sense, right? It's not Ben who's been hyping this stuff up. And then now we found the guy and now he's then now realizing that, oh, you know, my fig is highly desired. I'm able to sell this thing for $200, $300 a tree. Who in their right mind wouldn't be selling that thing for $200, $300 a tree? If they could get those prices, if you could sell every, fi every single fig tree on the most vigorous variety you have, that's the most precocious variety you have, that thing grows like a weed, guys. I've seen it myself. And if I could just chop down a bunch of my trees, propagate them, and sell them for $200, $300 a tree, you better believe I'm going to be doing that. You better believe it. So again, it's not the seller, it's the buyer that's making this issue. Um, so hopefully that, that clears that whole thing up. And now again, once we found the original, and Robert, the guy who is the founder, realized that, and we told him this, that this is not Golden Riverside, you should give it a different name, he then came up with Golden Rainbow. And that's how it exists today. That's how it was created. Okay, so um, let's keep going here. Christopher says, uh, talking about location, its effect on flavor, an interesting read for folks. Okay, I'll check it out. I've actually been um, reading up on wine grapes and reading on how different wines and the grapes that are grown are really affected by location and the soil types. It's really been interesting. I'm actually going to create a nice little blog post and a nice little post, I think, on our figs talking about it because I think I have a really interesting experiment I, I would like to try this year. Um, Server Part Depot says, hey, uh, it's it's Saif. I'm, pr I'm sure I'm pronouncing, I think I'm pronouncing your name right. Sorry if I'm butchering that. Hello from New York. Hope all is well with you. Hey, man. Everything's good. I hope everything is well with you too. TJ said, I kind of struggle with appreciating a certain variety out loud. I want to talk about it, yet I don't want the prices to go up. <laughs> Got to make some friends. That's true. Yeah, it, it, it's tough because you think a variety is really tasty. and you, If you had a variety, let's say, that was the tastiest variety in existence and no one knew about it. Let's say I had Black Madeira and I was growing Black Madeira and no one had any idea that Black Madeira ever existed. And I was growing it for years, and I knew how tasty it was. Wouldn't you think you would want to come out and just 
tell every single person that this fig is amazing you know how hard it is to keep that in and keep that to yourself um okay so then dken says uh ross do you think golden riverside and yellow long neck are the same fig i do um personally i think there may be some kind of minor adaptation there but i think there's a fig variety called long yellow which may or may not be the same thing as yellow long neck but i do think it is indeed the same thing i personally have wanted to compare my yellow long neck to long yellow i had long i had long yellow and uh I killed it by accident. The thing didn't survive over the winter time in the greenhouse last year, I think. So I would have had a nice little comparison between all three of them, but um, I don't know for sure. And you can certainly tell by the leaf structure and by the fruits that they're very similar looking figs, without a doubt. I, I do think though there is some sort of um, there is some sort of maybe a minor adaptation or a weird thing in Robert's climate that's making the fig look the way it does. It does. It shouldn't really look like that, probably in a whole host of climates. And maybe long yellow or yellow long neck, we've never really grown. I don't know anyone that's growing that variety in Robert's part of the country. Even in Seattle where Ben lives, the figs look weird, man. The figs look weird. They don't look right. And they don't get a lot of sun. They have a lot of moisture up there. So in all honesty, you can't really look at a fig in that portion portion of the country and then compare it to another fig that's grown in a different part of the country. It's also like um, growing, seeing a fig that was ripened in Malaysia. They just have so much water there. It completely changes the color of the fig. You can't look at a picture of a fig that's been grown in California that's been caprified and then compare it to something that's been grown in the Northeast. They just look visually very different. And unless you've been looking at these figs in a whole host of climates, you can't really ac accurately identify them. I can't say that a Villette de Bordeaux grown in California is the same thing as a Villette de Bordeaux in Pennsylvania if, as an example, it was an unknown. Um, and we had no idea what Villette de Bordeaux was. You know, it would be very difficult to accurately say they're the exact same thing. But because we've seen Violet de Bordeaux grown all over the country, all over the world, in so many climates, I know what it looks like in this country, I know what it looks like in that climate, and you can then say, okay, well, that's the same fig. Or have a high degree of certainty that it is the same fig. But here's the issue, yellow long neck, or long yellow, I have never ever seen a photo of that fig grown in that part of the country alongside where golden rainbow is grown. So that's the issue. We've never had that side-by-side -side comparison to know for sure, but I could say with a pretty high degree of certainty that they're very similar. Could I say with a very high degree of certainty that they're exactly the same? Probably not. And there is probably some minor adaptation that separates them in some very small way that we don't know of just yet. Wayne said, uh, Grease de St. Jean, how do they do for you? Uh, this is my first year with Grease de St. Jean, but I have a fig very similar called DN Manel. You can see a video of that, Wayne, on my YouTube channel, DN Manel. You can type in M-A-N-E-L and it'll come up and I swear that fig is the same thing. It looks just like the same thing. It has the same fruit, um, same description of the flavor, same leaf structure, everything looks the same. Is it exactly the same? Same scenario with Long Yellow and Golden Riverside. We don't know. We don't know for sure. We don't have genetic testing. But I can certainly say that it's going to be very similar to Grease de St. Jean, and I like it. Let's put it like that. Grease de St. Jean is a really good fig in just about every climate. Um, okay, Loza says, I only have Hardy Chicago. Does that mean they're no good? Hardy Chicago is one of the best figs in existence. Evan Campbell says, saw Campanari and Col Noir cuttings sell for $9 a piece after your video. If you're watching this video, you know who you are. You're right. People literally saw the video of Campanari and Col Noir, the, the, the video I did of the varieties that I'm most excited about in this upcoming season. They then bought them overseas from Thierry and then tried to sell them for outrageous prices, and they did. They did sell for those outrageous prices. Um, 
Chad says the name and the story sells the craze. Colonel Littman's Black uh, Black Cross is nuts now. Thermalito, he's is mere. He's just naming out different figs that are have are selling for high prices. Uh, DKN says how the Black Madeira KK hype start anyways. Well, people are obsessed with the virus, fig mosaic virus. They think there's some big issue with the virus, and there isn't. And I've tried to explain this to people numerous times in numerous videos, and it doesn't get through anyone's head. But in all honesty, fig mosaic virus is not an issue at all. In fact, I did a fig tour I filmed yesterday. I toured all the figs in the patio, all the figs in the ground, and there's a tree that I have that was riddled with FMV last year, and it looks completely spotless this year, and it's doing incredible. And it's all about feeding them. If you feed them well, they have the right nutrients, they're not gonna have fig mosaic virus. They're gonna perform just as well as the other variety with without it and they all have it let's be honest um dkn says i like panache because it's so pretty it is very pretty i have to say tj says cardinio looks amazing cardinio does look pretty good but my hopes are not as high as some other varieties like campaneri and col noir or aishia black where's aishia black no one talks about that fig anymore uh, where are you going to grow? Okay, Alex says, uh, where are you going to grow your fig orchard in order to sell the fruit to the public? Pennsylvania? Yeah. Yeah, we planted 50 varieties or so this year to then hopefully next year have enough production to sell locally. And somewhere likely in Pennsylvania, maybe Jersey, Joysey, um, somewhere in a colder place that's central to New York, Philadelphia, Princeton, Doylestown, um, King of Prussia, you know, all these more rich areas in the area. Um, that's where you're going to sell the figs the most. So you kind of want to be central somewhere to those locations. And that's what I would like to do is if I wanted to sell them to all those different locations, you could. And uh, of course, with the help of a greenhouse, you can grow figs anywhere. Tommy says, Ross, what do you do with the newly rooted cuttings come this time that you're going to keep, or do you just put them outside and throw them in the greenhouse for some extra sun and heat? Um, well, okay, so if you just got some cuttings, you just rooted them, um, I actually am putting out a video, I think tomorrow or the next day, I think it's coming out the 11th, if I'm not mistaken, um, there's a video on rooting them in the ground. And that is what I did with a lot of them. And I actually took really highly valuable Campaneri cuttings that, of course, are now selling for crazy amounts of money because of my recommendation. I took those cuttings and stuck them in the ground. I didn't root them in a pot. <laughs> I just stuck them in the ground. And every single one of them is taken. Um, if you do that now, around this time, even a little earlier, you heat up the ground really well, you can create yourself a nice propagation bed in the ground. I think it's better than rooting them outside in a pot. I think it's really much better than rooting them in the pot um, because they have all the excess nutrients and they have a good amount of water. It's not going to drown in a pot and it's not going to drown in the soil if it's well aerated, it's well amended. Um, I think it's a better way to do it. And it's not too warm right now in our climate that they're not going to desiccate. You could wrap them with parafilm, but I've planted really long, two foot, three foot long cuttings that are pretty thick from like two year old wood or really thick one year old wood. Just stick them in the ground and you're going to get a tree, dude. Uh, hello, everyone that's just now joining or um, said hello in the chat. Uh, hello. DKN says if it turns out to be yellow long neck, though, then I think it's wrong to sell them as something else after Ben hyped it up. That was the issue I had, just my opinion. Yeah, I mean, if you, uh, if it is indeed yellow long neck, which Ben had no idea if it was, he wouldn't, he is not for sure, and I had no idea until I saw, until I saw Robert's photos, I thought for sure it was yellow long neck. But looking at Ben's photos, because he has such a weird climate, I had no idea what that fig was. Um, and you could have easily have thought at some point it even was it could have been Golden Riverside from UC Davis um, Chad said thanks buddy for another great video you speak the truth thanks Chad 
We should talk soon, by the way, buddy. Um, let's see here. Where else are we at? Uh, RJ says, Ross, do you think Genovese, Nero, AF, and Italian 258 are the same thing? Yes. There's a whole little debate on that craziness, and at the end of the day, I don't care about the craziness, but I do believe they're exactly the same fig. Um, and we will never know exact without genetic testing, but even with genetic testing, who the hell knows, man? They're the same fig. Don't sweat it. Um... Melinda says, the question, how old does a fig tree have to be before it grows figs? I live in Arkansas. Um, depends on the variety. I'm not going to lie with you. Uh, I've fruited some figs that I grafted onto a pretty strong rootstock. They put out some strong growth, and then two months later, I or a month later, I pinched it, and then three months after that, it fruited. So I put on grafts that are very small, grafted them, and that year they fruited for me and put out a pretty reasonable quality fruit. Um, I've also rooted some cuttings and in the process of me rooting cuttings, they put out figs. I mean, within like, you know, the first month or two of them rooting cuttings, they're putting out figs, which is insane. Some of these varieties are just very precocious. Other varieties, I would say like the Col de Doms, the, the um, Black Mission types, the Adriatic types, at least some of the Adriatic types. Um, I think those are the major ones. Things like Panache, a lot of the Ramadas. Um, they just take a long time to fruit, and I think it has a lot to do with their vigor. If a, if a fig tree, a fig variety has so much vigor, and it doesn't slow down, it may take years before it slows down. Finally, I have a Martinique Ramada tree that could actually be Panache. I don't know. There's a whole mix-up with that. But because it grows so vigorously, and it's done that for years, now it's in its third year, its third season, it's finally slowed down, and it's finally putting on fruit. So if you're not getting fruit early on, there's definitely some strategies you can do. But for the most large majority of them, you can get them to fruit in the first year. Um, Chad says, never trust a California fig pick if you live in Iowa. <laughs> It's true. If a fig looks really good in California and you live in a cold climate, don't trust that photo. Um, Lincoln says, is it because of caprification that you get different look in fig wasp areas versus non-fig wasp areas? A lot of it has to do with caprification, but the large majority of it is because of the heat, the sunlight, um, and also the differences in water. Those three things, also the differences in soil, Maybe there's some different nutrients in the soil that are changing the appearances of the fig. Also, when are these people picking them? Are they picking them early or are they picking them late? I can't tell you how many times I've seen a photo of a fig where somebody picks it way too early, posts the photo, and says, this is a great fig. And I'm looking at myself, in no way is that fig good. In no way. Because it's not picked right. It doesn't. It's not at the right ripeness. How could it taste good? Um, let's see here. Marsha says, what's the real name of GM-153? I have no idea. GM-153. Some of the GM figs don't have a name. Marsha, where'd you get it? Uh, Loza says, thanks for awesome new to figs. Started growing this year. I love your channel. Thanks for all you do. Thanks for watching. Tarek says, Ross, your thoughts on Alma? Thank you, Ohio 6A. Alma's a good fig. Although it's a honey fig, I think it has potential. Um, I haven't given it a decent enough shot, and I never really did. And um, I grew it at one point, but then I got rid of it, and it could be pretty good. But a lot of people, what they do is they get a fig and they forget about it. Either they like it and then f and just completely forget about it, and it's just not in the discussion anymore. And Alma's one of those figs. It's just not in the discussion. Um, it could certainly be one of those figs that certainly a nice little hidden gem. Definitely. I think it has potential to be not just your average honey fig. There's some definite other weird flavors in there that could separate it from your typical, like, Dotato or Kadota. You know, Peter's honey type honey fig. 
Uh, Davis says, hey, Ross, what do you mean when you say you're going to sell figs? Fig trees or fig fruit or both? Well, right now I'm already selling the trees, but I am going to be selling the fruit hopefully next year. That's going to be – that's already in the works. Um, Alex said, why did Ben B. stop making videos? Is he hibernating? I don't know. Did he stop making videos? I thought he just put out a video recently. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that people go through throughout their life. Yeah, he hasn't put out a video in three months, but that doesn't mean he's not going to. Um, like I said, people just go through stuff in their life, man. They run out of time. Ben has kids, man. I don't have kids. You know, Ben does all this different stuff. He has a photography business, I think. I think he also has a, a actual um, different job that maybe is even full time. Um, you know, the man's busy, I'm sure. And I'm sure all this other drama that's been going on with this variety has kind of turned him off. Why, why should I put out my opinions and videos that are inspirational and helpful to people if all I'm getting back is negative and just people in my face about particular things? You know, it really is a big turnoff. And um, I go through it every day. Um, you know, I'm just better at it, I think, than other people. Or Ben's probably good at it too. You just have to deal with this stuff. And if I can go here to the comments here that I have to I have to uh, respond to, we can see all these comments that most of them I've deleted on this particular video that took off. It has like a half a million views or something like that. And um, where is this damn video, guys? But because this video has a half a million views and it gets a lot of attention, there's a lot of trolls. There's a lot of negative people. Um, commenting on this video. And there's a lot of just drama and really unfounded just crap that you have to go through. Here's the video right here. That gets a lot of attention. A lot of uh, just negativity. Yeah, there's some great comments here. There's a lot of nice things people said. But at the end of the day, I didn't think this video was ever going to take off. I didn't think the video I did on pinching was ever going to take off. Let's see here. Why you should be pinching your fig trees. This video has almost 300,000 views. And believe it or not, I talk all about pinching in this video, and I don't show the actual act of pinching once. How ridiculous is that, guys? I don't even show the actual act of pinching. So then all these people, look at this. I'm still confused on how and where we pinch. What does pinching look like? Uh, you would not believe how many people commented and said that I'm an idiot, I'm this, I'm that, trolling me, telling me my video is garbage, when in reality, originally, I put this video out for the fig community, for the people that know what they're doing, not for the general public. Not for just Joe Schmo to come along and say, oh, what's this pinching thing? And then think about it. And then, you know, this is for advanced people. This wasn't for your average everyday grower. So I never included what pinching even looked like. And then I get all these negativity and comments on the video. So certainly this is not something I want to see. This is not something I want to hear about. And it's certainly not making me want to put out more videos. So it all depends on the person, and I'm sure that is a big reason why Ben has not put out a video. I mean, you know, any YouTuber, I don't care who it is, that's a big reason and a big thing that they have to deal with. Anyone that ever puts out their opinion on anything is subject to criticism. And if you can't take criticism, then you should never put out your opinion. And that's just the reality of what it is about putting your opinion out there and, and putting out your own content, your own art, your own things that people are always going to critique it. They're always going to have an issue with it. You're never going to be able to, to um, you know, to, uh, to satisfy everybody. It's just never, ever going to happen. So, 
you know, that's my little advice there for anybody out there who's not just doing YouTube videos. Maybe if Ben is watching or something, it's not just for Ben. It's for any of you guys out there who believe in something and want to put your opinion out there. It's, you know, there's a lot of criticism that comes with it. Um, RJ says, what variety do you recommend? The cold, most cold hardy for zone 6B. Hardy Chicago. The second hardiest which I'm starting to think would be the hardiest, even more hardy than hardy Chicago is something called Campanieri, but we don't know for sure. Um, I don't also just like to recommend the most cold hardy um, because flavor is also really important. And something like Floria, Michurinska 10 is very hardy, but not the tastiest fig. So I would say Floria, I would say English brown turkeys are also pretty hardy, something called Dalmaty, something called Brunswick. Um, St. Martin is supposed to be quite hardy. Oh, wait. You asked me about jujubes. <laughs> I read that wrong. Sorry, RJ. What variety of jujube do you recommend? I think most of them are hardy to 6B. Uh, but for a colder zone that has a shorter season, you need to go with something like Lee because the issue with mulberries is, or the jujubes is not that they don't survive the winter but they don't produce quick enough. The issue with mulberries is that you need to get them awake earlier. They should act like a fig. You should wake them up very early, heat up the soil, put them in an area that gets full sun, lots of heat, and you're gonna have a successful jujube, but you also need to pay attention to a variety that will fruit for you in shorter season climates, because they don't. They wake up too late, their crops too late, and a lot of people don't get a full crop off of jujubes. Um, so Lee is your best bet. It's the most proven variety. If you can get in touch with Cliff England at England's Nursery, he'd probably tell you the same thing. Melinda says, oh, I purchased a three-year-old fig tree and have had it for three years and nothing. Okay, well, I've done a whole video, Melinda, on that particular topic. Um, something like, why isn't my fig tree fruiting? Hmm. It's somewhere in here. Oh, here we go. Why hasn't my fig tree fruited? This video will tell you literally every reason why it potentially hasn't fruited. Uh, Vladimir says, what can you do to make, fig, uh, to make figs fruit as soon as possible? Pinching. Thinning. Um, high high uh, phosphorus fertilizers, bloom fertilizers. Um, make sure you have also covered all the micronutrients. You need a lot of heat. Put them in a place that gets a lot of heat. I'm talking over 100 degrees. Um, you have a greenhouse, put them in an environment in the greenhouse for about four or five hours a day at about 100, 110 degrees, and they're gonna fruit. Just you watch. Um, Vic D says, I've been top dressing my containers in the spring with Dr. Earth and a, harmful, a handful of lime for a few years of great success. What do you add anything else to this to cover both micro and macronutrients? We just did a video on this too. We did a couple of videos. Um, let's see if I can get you that video here. Um, we did a video on fertilizing them and also what I'm using. So this is the one on the amendments. People got really pissed about this video too. It's like, damn, dude, calm down, you know? Hey guys, it's from um, I told you guys what I'm gonna use and that was it. That was the whole idea behind the video. And then people got pissed at me. <laughs> um, let's see here. What else would I use though? Just coming out of my mouth, uh, mycorrhizae, some kind of silica supplement, um, cover all the ma macro and micronutrients, well, cover all the micronutrients with something like green sand, you know, rock dust is good. Uh, also, um, what else? Lime, I think calcium and magnesium are really good. Um, I think a lot of 
phosphorus and potassium are also really good. Um, less so on the nitrogen. You don't need too much nitrogen with your figs. You just need to get them off to a good start early in the season and you want to stop all that nitrogen. Um, let's see. Tommy said, any synonyms for Delena? Do you mean Diana? I don't know what Delena is. Mr. Hain Han, um, sorry for mispronouncing your name. What's your favorite green fig? Well, I have a lot of favorite green figs. I guess Col de Don Blanc. Um, you'd be more specific. Lincoln says, I read somewhere that Alma is immune to FMB. Yeah, uh, that's the word on the street. Never had it, never tested it, but it has some Ficus palmata genes, genes in it. So the Ficus palmata is um, resistant and I think immune to fig mosaic virus. So um, you can give it all the mosaic virus you want and it won't get it. Michael says, my son thinks I have issues with my figs and my fruit trees. Do you, do your neighbors and Friends think you're nuts too. Yeah. Yeah, they do. <laughs> um, yeah, everyone struggles with that. If you're obsessed with fruit, yeah. But uh, once you feed them these fruits, they won't think you're as nuts. They get it. Um, Chad says, Ben just had a baby and was also thinning down his trees. Like a lot of hobbies, people move on to other interests. Yeah. He could be moving on to another interest. Um, you never know kids man DKN says I didn't realize how much crap you have to deal with but just know most of us really appreciated the info your videos laugh taught me how to graft an air layer well thank you for the nice words to be honest though I, I don't mean to make it of a big deal um, it is a lot of crap here and there but overall it's a good thing the positives outweigh the negatives otherwise I wouldn't be doing this um, Christopher said I think there's probably been fist fights between academics on recommended amendments. Yeah. You think about um, Egyptology. You know, Egyptology, they try to figure out what happened 10,000 years ago in Egypt. It's kind of similar to figs. You just never know. You don't have all the answers. There's no way of ever really knowing. And, um, you know, these people put out their opinions and then they get criticized and there's fights and people think they know what they are talking about for 50, 100 years, you know, long time. And then they find out new evidence comes out and turns out no one knew anything. And it's the same thing with figs. I feel like there's probably a lot of information out there. We still don't know. We could still learn. That's why I've been looking into um, wine grapes and different types of soil and all that. TJ said, have you fruited the sandbag yet? No. I can tell you San Baggio is going to be the, one of those big figs that's expensive and um, can actually back it up. Melinda Reeve says, thank you for all your help. I'm new to growing the fig tree. I've been watching your videos and learned a lot. appreciate the work you put into the videos you share. Well, thank you. I'm glad you're learning. And uh, if I can inspire any of you guys to do anything, that is a success. John said, hey John, what's going on? Hey Ross, thanks for all your videos. Ben just had a new born about a month ago. I bought a couple of trees that he's he's selling and he's selling great varieties or great prices if anyone's interested. Yeah. Um, thanks for sharing that piece of information, John. Uh, Tommy said, is it true? Or if, it's, if that's true about Alma, wouldn't it make sense to graft onto Alma? Mm. yeah it would Alma could make a really good rootstock it's super vigorous maybe too vigorous LSU purple is supposed to have a neat root knot nematode resistance and I recommend using that as rootstock for anyone in Florida or heavily root knot nematode resistant soils and believe it or not my grandparents who are in Florida they live in Florida Boca Raton Florida they have a fig tree in the ground and it is LSU purple and it is growing really, really well. And they have very sandy soil. I've been there many times. They've tried Desert King with very little success. And now the LSU Purple is going off the walls. Vic D 
says that Dr. Earth claims it covers the array of micronutrients needed, then you're good. It, it should. You can read it on the back of any of these fertilizers covering the micronutrients. You can always add in more. It doesn't hurt. You just got to cover all of them. They're like people. We're, you know, we need every single vitamin. If we don't have a certain vitamin, our body doesn't work nearly as well. It's the same thing with plants. Cabin Bound says silica is sand. They're different types. I'm just having a trouble seeing right now, guys. I need new contact lenses. I'm going to be at the eye doctor pretty soon. Does that say fumed silica used in... Fume silica used in viscoffers, the packets used to keep products dry, pills is silica. Okay, um, I'm talking about the silica that's in the Earth's crust in large quantities. I'm not also not talking about the element silicone, silicon. I'm not talking about breast implants. Um, yeah, I don't know if that makes any sense. But anyway, guys, we're getting to the end of this little live stream here. Uh, we got down to the bottom of all your questions. So what I'm going to do now is end the live stream very soon. If anyone has any other questions I, you need answered, now's the time. I want to thank everybody for joining us. What I'm going to do after we're done the live stream is actually answer everybody's comments that have been piling up in the last couple weeks and answer everybody's questions in the YouTube comments. I want to mention... To everybody out there right now that if you are asking me a question, please ask me the question on the YouTube video. It helps out my videos. It also detracts and you're skipping the line when you try and message me personally. Um, if you're messaging me personally, um, I'm going to tell you from this point on, and I've been telling people on Facebook, you know, if you have a question, put that on the YouTube video it pertains to. Um, I also want to mention, guys, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We've been doing really well getting a lot of you guys on the new website here, and we've actually done a, quite a few different blog posts. I've been on the radio for you guys out there that wanted to listen to me on the radio. I was on the radio to talk about with Stephen Biggs. We talked about um, all the figs, or what to do with all the figs in the springtime, how to get them ready. It was really well done. Steven's the greatest guy, nicest dude. Gave me some nice little tips on how to write a book, and we should be at some point, some point in the future, writing a book on figs. Who knows when that's going to happen and when I'm going to have time, but this year I'm certainly going to be documenting and taking many, many photographs of fruit. All the fruit I, I grow, we're going to be taking many photographs to hopefully have lots of illustrations for our book in the future. Um, I want to put the uh, book out there mostly on varieties, not necessarily a big guide on growing them because that's already been done. Pons does a really great job. But on the more common varieties that exist and why you should be growing many of these varieties and the differences and all that, um, but yeah, the blog is doing really well. We've kind of, what I've been doing here and what Steven gave me some nice recommendations for the book is that you've got all these talks, all these videos, all these posts, posts that you write up on our figs or even on the blog or even on social media. Just take all that information that already exists and put it into a, into a book. So yeah, that's what we're doing. Also, guys, if you got this far and you're still here with me, you've been listening this whole time, um, just want to recommend, you don't have to, check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash Ross Ratty. Even a dollar a month is way better than watching every single one of my videos every day. Every thousand views I get on my videos is about $6. So even if you were to watch my videos a thousand times, that was six months worth of uh donations so if you guys if you guys gave me a dollar it's way better off than watching my videos and it's just a really nice way of supporting your favorite artist i think no pressure uh let's see here lincoln said can you graft onto mail um can you graft on the mail fig and get figs 100 percent yes you can also graft um 
You can also graft onto Smyrna types and get figs. It's the the scion or the variety on top that really matters. Tarek said, I remember the video you did with your grandparents talking about LSU purple. Yeah. Hopefully when I visit them, I'm going to take a video of their fig and post that. I think that's really good information for people out there. Um, I did just give it to them though, but it's been growing like a weed. They've been telling me <laughs> my grandpa's going nuts. Uh, let's see. Melinda said, I didn't know if fig trees were male or female. Yeah. Yep. There's definitely some varieties out there that just won't fruit. So you got to pay attention to that. Um, Alex says, thank you. Thank you, Alex, for joining, joining us here in the live stream. I also want to thank everyone else. Thank you guys. I hope this one was informative and, um, you know, I didn't insult anyone. That was not my intention. It was really for educational purposes. So if someone got a little offended by this video, I do apologize. But uh, that really, I think, saves you guys a ton of money, this video. It really does. I mean, if I wish I had somebody tell me this my first year of growing figs because it would have saved me a couple thousand dollars. Um, I did. I spent like probably about three grand my first year. So anyway, guys, thank you so much. And uh, we'll catch you all for the next episode of Fruit Talk. We'll see you for next uh, the video tomorrow. All right. Take care, guys. Good night.